Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. Um, as you can see, I've got another pickup, um, Super Nintendo. Uh, you'll notice the two-tone uh, two um, thing going on here. Um, I don't know if it's got a bot, different bottom case than it originally, um, you know, was produced with. Um, I doubt it. I think it's probably just the plastic at the bottom part's faded, but the top top part's okay. So I'm quite comfortable with that. Um, might just leave that as it is. Actually, I'm not too bothered about the bottom part being sort of a yellow sort of shade there. Um, I could always just clean that up with some HCO2, I might do that at a later date. But as you can see, it's um, in very good condition. There's just a couple of light scratches and things and marks. I will clean it up, um, get some plastic polish and stuff on there as usual. Um, but I'm just going to just strip this down, um, just clean it out, clean out the cartridge slot and stuff, clean the inside, just see if there's any leaking caps or anything like that. Um, in order to get in this, you need one of these um, security bits, uh, things here. Um, this is from an N64, and yeah, lo and behold, that fits fine. So. Um, Looks like this, those two screws there, two in the middle and two at the back I think, so uh, we'll give that a go. Something you might have noticed there, just underneath, um, and I've not mentioned, it's the Japanese version of this. Um, and the reason I've gone for a Japanese version is a lot of them are in better condition, strangely enough. And obviously it's 60 hertz, um, you know, NTSC. Um, so, you know, you get the, uh, you know, better slots, like the faster clock speed and stuff. Um, and these will run, you know, games from other regions if you do uh, mod and stuff to uh, CIC chip. And, um, I've actually got an EverDrive, well, an SD2 uh, SNES coming for this, so I don't really need to worry about the region stuff anyway. I've got one Japanese original uh, game that I've uh, just got uh, on the side there for testing, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, Starwing, uh, Star Fox, whatever it's called. So. Yeah, it just looks looks like the lid just comes straight off there. Um, there's a bit of fading there on the eject button, you can see. It's very light though, I mean, it's, it's pretty good wheel, all things considered. Um, so it needs a bit of a clean outside, there's lots of dust and fluff and stuff. Um, just get rid of these screws. Six, that's correct. Um, yeah, so separate subboard here for the uh, control ports and uh, power LED. I think that's power LED, yeah it will be power LED, Mains, you know, your on off switch. Um, these take um, AC by the way, it's like the NES, um, it expects I think 9 volts AC, but um, the Mega Drive uh, power supply fits and works perfectly in there, so that's what I'm using for the moment. Um, I will get a proper power supply at some point. Um, <coughs> something I've just spotted there, you can see that, you've got a fuse, uh, just so you can zoom in so you can get a bit of a closer look at that. Um, yeah, just in that gap there. I'll just move that wire out of the way a bit so you can see it slightly, slightly better if you can. That black, um, black ceramic type package, sort of free, free you know, it's held when you just by the solder points, it's actually floating over the, the gap and you know, cuts out on the board uh, for safety reasons and things. Got a voltage regulator there, uh, it's just a 7805. Didn't expect that. I thought these are the different. Uh, maybe the different revisions have got different regulators, but that's just a, strand, a standard straight 7805. Um, some SMD caps, so that's interesting. I suspect that one or two of these might need swapping out. Um, I, I've, I have just tested this briefly, and I get a good picture. I had to mess around with the SCART cable because I got a, um, a new um, cheap PAL. Um, you know, I'm not really yeah, well, PAL, I guess it's SCART cable, and um, it was pretty crappy to be honest. The, the brightness levels and things for, for the colours were all screwed up and it just wasn't right so I had to rewire it um, and I rewired it according to this diagram uh, here um, so you have a slightly better look at that so you'll in fact no it wasn't this is the original diagram this is how a PAL diagram looks with the 75 ohm resistors between each of the colours and ground and um, sort of like pull downs or something on there um, and for the NTSC models, uh, including this JAP unit, you don't need that. You don't need those three resistors. You can remove those resistors, you can get rid of that resistor there. And what you do is just have, um, uh, in series, with the red, green and blue, a 220 microfarad capacitor in each one, going into each of the colour inputs there. Um, and that solved my problem, so that was that. And I'll show you that up uh, working in a minute, so, just so you can see. Um, but the reason I think these caps might need doing is the picture's just a little bit noisy. You know, for RGB, it's not quite as clean as I would expect. Um, but I am getting an RGB um, picture. You know, the TV is telling me it's an RGB mode. You just you can, you can probably just see under there. There's a lot more SMD caps. So I'll just uh, remove some of these components and things now and get these screws out. And hopefully, we should be able to have a better look at the board. 
So there you go, we'll strip right down now. Um, I'll just zoom in a bit, get a slightly better look. Uh, I'll try and move the board around a bit here. So, um, yeah, I've got a reset switch here. Can't see what that is. Um, is that the CIC? Possibly. Um, but it just looks like uh, some sort of logic 7404, I think, or something. Not sure. Um, yeah, Hyundai, Hyundai S RAM. Um, those 64K, 32K, could be 32K each, those, by the looks of things. Um, PPU, so the PPU, you know, it, logically you've got one one PPU, but on a physical level, we've got two chips here. Um, it's interesting, they split, um, split that, despite the logical diagrams and things in the spec for this, showing the PPU is really kind of one entity. Uh, well, certainly from documents I've seen. Um, is that a W RAM? I'm not really sure what that is, um, but it's Nintendo and it says WS-W RAM. So we've got some sort of uh, Nintendo bespoke uh, RAM there. Uh, CPU, um, I'm not sure what that adjustment there is for. So, well, it's going to be some sort of minor, you know, clock, fine clock adjustment of some sort for the uh, video signal or the maybe the main master clock or something, I'm not sure. Um, so that's interesting. Um, you can see the power switch connects via this uh, onto this little connector here. I've removed the heat sink. Interesting thing with that is no heat sink compound on there, so I'll put some heat sink compound onto that. Um, these caps that I mentioned, if you can just get quite a close look at those, you can see they look all right. There's no signs of leakage, I and mean, there's lots of dirt and you know fluff and stuff on this board. It's clean enough. So flux around the expansion connector there. Um, so I'll probably clean that up as well. Um, can't really see what that is um, without a magnifying glass. Another cab there, that's SMB, that's looking okay. Not sure what that is, I think that's a coil, L1 it says. Um, an inductor. What's that there, bridge rectifier is it? Yeah, I think, I think that's probably a bridge rectifier. So that's changing your um, AC into DC. Um, you get a black screen on one of these, could be a fault there, could be a fault here. Could be for where could be these SMD cap uh, sorry off the camera SMD caps in various places. So those are typically the problems you're going to get with these. I would think um, you're probably going to get problems with SRAMs as well at some point. But um, I wouldn't think they give you a black screen, but they may well do. I don't know what kind of self test these things do when they power up and stuff. Or um, I guess it depends where the fault is. But those are the faults I'd be looking for. If you get one of these and you know it's scrubs faulty and you just don't get anything at all, maybe a black screen or something, you know, investigate your power side of things. Those, you know, the three components there. Um, what's that there? VR. Can't see what the hell that is. Don't know. I don't know. There's some sort of beefy diode or something. Or what? This is VR one. No idea what that is. You've got a, some sort of diode there as well. It says D one. Um, certainly. You know, you could have problems around there. Um, that looks like a video encoder or something, just because of the position here with these caps and the, the output um, being there. And it's just say uh, S-ENC encoder, perhaps. So maybe that's an NTSC. Maybe it's even a PAL slash NTSC encoder. Maybe it's configurable by jumpers. I don't know. Um, got another SMB cap down here as well. I just spotted. But again, there's no signs of leakage. Um, I think that's a crystal by the looks of things. Um, and then of course we've got another crystal down here as well, that might be the master clock crystal, not sure. Um, very interesting. So one of the other things you know, you'll know, you notice just from looking at this here, there's no, doesn't appear to be any sound hardware. And that's because it seems to be on this particular version, I don't know they're all the same, but it's modular. You've got this uh, SV, S, S, SHVC-sound module. Um, so I'll perhaps just crack the lid open on that now, hopefully it's not soldered on and we'll just have a look inside there, but it's quite nice the way that's modular, you get a problem with your sound, you could just literally swap it, uh, which is quite cool, so I'll just get the lid off that. So as you can see the lid just pops off there quite nicely, um, and in here we've got, uh, as you can see, a Nintendo, uh, I can't see what that says now, looks like SMP Sony, um, I think, SMP Sony, yeah, that, that chip there. Um, SDSP, another Sony chip. I mean, it's got the Nintendo logo on there as well, but um, it's uh, marked Sony. So, it's, you know, uh, Sony part here that looks like RAM. So I think we've got 32k sound RAM. And I think that's probably 32k. Anyway, um, you'll find out more from looking at the schematics and things from this um, than you're going to get from me. This is really just a tear down for my benefit. Just have a look inside, see what state it's in, and just show you a few things while I'm there. Really. Um, yeah, a couple of little caps there, 47 microfarad, don't think uh, those need swapping out, they look fine to me. Um, 
It's nice that it's modular like that though, it's quite cool. Uh, quite like that. So we're part way reassembled there. I've got some um, heat sink uh, compound on the 7805 there. Cleaned up a bit, vacuumed out a bit. Um, but I just thought to show you this here just in case you dismantle one of these yourself and you're not entirely sure how it goes back together. Um, if I just take this back out, um, hopefully it'll be a bit clearer. Um, it's not that difficult to work out, but I was a bit stressed for a minute there, just thinking, oh my god, how am I going to do this? If you look, <clears throat> if you look into this, um, the, this plastic, this plastic here in the case, the moulding, you've got um, the hole obviously for the main bar, but then there's a little hole down there. So if you take your spring and put the end in there like that, line it up with a hole, and then you want to slide your bar <clears throat> basically through, you know, make sure it's through the plastic piece there and into the spring and into the hole of the plastic and then as you just sort of sit that down like that um, if we just zoom out a little bit as you can see um, you know it sits it sits here like this then the, the key is to just bend this and put it into that little recess there um, and that's it and you can test that by you know just pressing that as if, as if you would you know because the plastic button in the case just pushes this down and it lifts these levers up here which just uh, you know lift the car out basically. It's a nice uh, simple elegant design though, I quite like it, I like the whole layout of this uh, SNES internally, it's uh, really nice and modular, it's very, you know, it's very much like other Nintendo systems really, nice and tidy and modular, easy to work on. Um, so that's it, I've just got my six screws there for the uh, lid now. Um, I did the same thing I've done previously where you just, you know, use a bit of a paper card edge or paper edge or something and just uh, get some ice pop and then just slide it in and out of the, um, you know, the cart slot there and vac it out as well um, and that's come out really well um, and it looks really clean so um, I'll get the lid back on and we'll uh, boot this thing up. There you go, it's all back together now, cleaned up. Um, it's come out quite well. Um, I mean the two-tone still thing is still going on. Um, here, but uh, I'm not that bothered to be honest because it's in very good nick. You know, if you if you look at the front of it and stuff and the top, there's uh, barely a scratch. You've got just the old tiny, 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 tiny mark. There's been a scratch there at some point, but you know, in the right line stuff, it's uh, it looks pretty good really, all things considered. Um, so I'm quite pleased with that. So I'll just uh, connect up the power and uh, video. Um, it's the same connect as far as I can see as the um, GameCube. Um, and then 64 use, could be wrong, looks very similar to me, um, and then obviously like I say, I've been using my Mega Drive for power supply at the moment, so you can see that's on. Um, something else interesting I'll point out here that I didn't realise, is uh, in all the years I had a SNES back in the day, is if you switch it on, you can't access the cart slot, which is really cool, it's a you know, protection mechanism there, so you can't plug things in while it's on, which is really nice. So, look at Star Fox in. Um, it's a similar thing with this, look at the state of this car, it's a two-tone car, you know, the back's sort of a yellow, it looks like it's a different back, I don't think this is the back that came with this, um, and obviously it's, you know, no, a pretty good front, um, Japanese version of Star Fox, so I should connect my controller, and at the moment I'm using a crappy, I don't know, a really crappy, um, cheap, you know, uh, I don't know, two or three quid job um, controller, yeah. I've, I've torn the, the face off there, it was like a piece of sticky paper or something, it was awful. And it was a bit marked and ripped anyway, so I'll clean it up a bit. Maybe these white marks will come off, but I think they're probably part of the moulding. Could be glue. I don't know, but I'll try and clean it up. But it's okay just to get me going. I've got an original controller coming on the way. It's described as faulty, but maybe I can, if it's the cable, maybe I can nick the cable off this one and fix the other one. So we'll give that a go. So. Right, so this is the following day here. I thought I'd just um, have a bit of play on this just to show you it working and stuff. And just talk about some of my um, experiences with the SNES. Um, it's very short really, and it's one of the systems that I didn't have for a particularly long time. Um, I'll just turn that up a tiny, tiny little bit. Hopefully that's not too loud uh, versus my voice. Um, this was the game I got with my SNES. Um, I can remember distinctly going out with my dad. Uh, I don't think I had a car, I didn't have a car at the time, I can't remember. I don't think I did, I was learning to drive. Didn't have a car at the time and um, got my dad to give me a lift and he took me to, uh, I think it would have been Comet back then. Um, here in the UK, a big sort of you know electrical uh, retailer place, you know, they sell all different products from different manufacturers and stuff. Um, you know, TVs, videos, washing machines, fridges, that sort of stuff. Um, and uh, they had a quite a good package for the SNES at the time, um, which um, came with Star Fox. Um, let's start this. As you can see, it's in Japanese, so uh, I'm not sure if that's training mode. I think it might be actually. Yeah, it is. 
to get past this thing about Mr. Star. Um, so uh, yeah, Star Fox, um, it just blew me away. I'd seen it demonstrated um, you know, on display and stuff previously. Um, I think it was the same day actually I'd seen it, earlier that day when I went out somewhere with my boss or something, I'd seen it in uh, Comet or Curry's or somewhere, and I was like, oh, I've got to get that game. It just looks awesome. So really it was the game that sold the system to me. Um, I'm trying to think whether it was before I had a Mega Drive, I think it was just after I had a Mega Drive. I think I got rid of my Mega Drive, I got an Amiga 500, and it was sometime around the time when I had the Amiga 500, it was a 500 plus I got, um, wow. new, um, that I got the SNES, so I had the SNES and the Amiga at the same time. Um, the other cool thing with the SNES is the sound is just awesome on this system. Um, it was very similar to me, I was drawn to it, not just from the graphics and stuff, but in the same sort of way I was the Amiga. What drew me to the Amiga was the sound, you know, the, the capability of sound on the Amiga with the PCM audio and stuff was just superb. And I think you've got, um, is it AD PCM or something on the SNES as well, it's more like eight channels and it's... I, I kind of try and... At that time I was drawing parallels in my mind between the two systems in terms of capability. The SNES was actually better, um, in retrospect, you know, it was more capable than the Amiga. Um, Probably, I would think, certainly with the, um, you know, the fact that it's had more channels now, dedicated RAM and stuff. Um, but yeah, the SNES and the, uh, the sound on the SNES is just awesome. It's uh, still to this day, I think the sound's awesome on the SNES. They did, they did a fantastic job of picking, uh, you know, the Sony chips and things that they uh, use for this. I'd be interested to know if they were used in any other products that, you know, the, the Sony um, sound hardware they used in the SNES, possibly some arcade hardware or something. I don't know. I don't think there were any other home systems or anything like that made use of it, um, no idea, you know, let me know if you know any more about that, but um, yeah, so the sound's awesome, so I didn't have that game for very long, maybe a month or something before I was you know, keen to try and get something else, um, I'm not really sure what this next game was actually, I think I went to, there was a, just near where I used to live, there was like a, you know, one of these uh, second hand game places, you know, they sold new games as well, but it's like, you know, a no name, you know, a company you've never heard of kind of thing, you know, a one man business type thing. And um, he sort of did uh, trade-ins on Mega Drive, SNES games, you know, primarily Mega Drive and SNES, I think he covered other things as well. Um, and I went there uh, just to see what it was like, and uh, he had loads of stuff, but there was like 50% of his stock was Japanese. Um, and it, I don't know how, but the guy convinced me, oh, you know, get this uh, Final Fight, because I was like, oh, you know, after a really good game, what should I get? He said, oh, if you like arcade games, you know, get Final Fight. Um, I think it was two, could have been three. I'm not sure, I haven't looked at the emulator, you know, I've not played them on the emulator so, uh, in the last 15 years or so, so I ain't got a clue which it was. All I remember is the music was absolutely kick-ass, and the sprites, you know, really large, you know, it's just what you expect of a Final Fight game. Um, so I'm going to cover that a bit more when I get my um, Everdrive, well it's not Everdrive, I'm getting this SD to SNES, which hopefully should arrive sometime next week. Uh, I'm playing badly here. Um, yeah, so that final fight was just awesome, I loved playing that, and it was a Japanese one, so at the same time what I had to do, I think he told me I needed some sort of adapter, and uh, it was very, quite cheap, it was like half oh, £8 or something, I'll throw one of these adapters in. I still don't know how he did it that cheap to, the de you know, to this day, really. Uh, they've got to cost more than that, in, certainly about then, in terms of the plastic and you know, connectors and stuff, so I, I don't know, maybe he was just selling them on at almost cost. Um, but those, those adapters, um, I do want one. Um, I'm going to have a look later on eBay, see if I can find one. You, you, if you've got a SNES, you've probably got one yourself or seen them at least. And it's like, um, it's got two, it's got, a, it's, it's like a cart, so it plugs into your cart slot, but it's got a cart slot sideways on. So you plug a, one card into the top of it, and you plug one card into the side of it. Uh, so your Japanese one goes on top, just like it's, you know, it's like when a cart plugged into a cart, effectively with your Japanese cart on top. And then in the side of this thing, you put a PAL cart. And the idea being is that it kind of intercepts the, the CIC, you know, the lockout lines and things, and reads the CIC chip from the PAL car, but, you know, provides the uh, console with the access to the, uh, you know, the Japanese, uh, you know, ROM, if you like. So as far as your console is concerned, um, <clears throat> you've got, uh, you know, a PAL, PAL game, uh, when actually you haven't, you're playing the Japanese one. I've, uh, from what I understand, you know, just something I read recently, is on newer, some of the newer games, I think some of the, some protection that got around that, so that doesn't actually work. I, I don't know. Quote, you know, quote me if I'm wrong. I just remember reading something somewhere that says that if you do CIC hacks and this, that, and the other, you know, um, they can work for the majority of games, but there are a few of the newer titles that that doesn't work with. Because I don't know. They've got some additional protection there somehow tied into the lockout chip. So uh, be interested to know if anyone knows more about that. 
Uh, I think moving forward, my next game after that was uh, Batman. Was it Batman Returns? Not Batman Returns. Batman. It was the beat and what Batman game. Might be Batman Returns. I can't remember. Um, where you sort of I think it's the one with the penguin and stuff, and it starts and it's like snowflakes falling down or something, and you see the penguin or something. I think at the beginning of it. That was uh, my third uh, SNES game, um, and that was just awesome. It was a Konami game, and the, that was my first Konami game, and I was just blown away with the sound and the Konami sort of implemented on their games. Even right from the intro logo, I just love that Konami intro logo on the SNES. It's just superb. It's, it's kind of gives me that fuzzy feeling, that the same fuzzy feeling that the Neo Geo logo gives me. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but as soon as I hear that Capcom. A jingle there, I'm like, you know, oh goodness, you know, this is a great system, you know, goodness inside kind of thing, it's very much like the Neo Geo. Um, so with Batman, yeah, Batman, I, got, I can't remember how far I got through that, I think I might have even beaten that, it's a very, very good game, I, I love that game, I'll definitely be getting an, an original copy of that at some point uh, for this. Um, I might have to do the CI some sort of mod first, some sort of region mod, the CIC or something, just to, so, so I can uh, play originals. I mean, the alternative is to get one of those adapters and just get a pal, uh, you know, a use the Star Fox as my um, donor CIC, if you like, while the game's running or something. So, I might do that. But anyway, Batman, that Batman game was awesome. I think it was Batman Returns, but, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, I can't honestly remember the name of it. Um, and then I think the next game I got after that, um, just trying to write the veins. I think it was probably Girls and Ghosts. Um, I didn't play very much of that, I've got to admit, it was rock hard at the time. I was just too busy with the Amiga and a few other things. Um, there was another game I got as well, and I just can't for the life. Oh, was it Super Double Dragon? Um, I rushed out and got that as well. I was, it's one of those, it's a, it's a weird thing. It was, I was sorely disappointed in the sense that, um, I, and I don't know if you've played it, but it's worth having a look if you've not, uh, for the Super Double Dragon for the uh, SNES. You'll know what I mean. It's um, it's not it's not a port. It's not a direct port. So you've not got the same sprites. You've not you've got the same moves and the same. You've probably got the same enemies, I think, from what I remember. But they don't look the same, you know. And there's lots of additional ones. So it's a completely different game, just using the name. You know, it's a title only sort of uh, thing, really. You know, it's got the Double Dragon name and box art and stuff. But actually, the game has got nothing. You know, no similarities to the arcade. Um, so that, that was why I was, I was initially disappointed, but actually as you play that game, it's not bad actually, it's pretty good, it's a good fighter. Um, so it, it still stands on, you know, it sort of has it's, its own merits really, you know, it, it achieves its own sort of positive reputation, um, but it's, you know, it's very, very different to uh, Double Dragon. Um, it wasn't long after that I got rid of my SNES, but just before I got rid of my SNES, there was a time where, um, and I was in the electronics trade by now, you know, I was repairing systems and stuff, retro systems. Um, and we were selling PCs, and there was a guy, uh, my old friend Andrew, went to school with. Uh, he was at university, um, and we kept in touch quite a bit back then. You know, this was before we you know, both, both went off and got jobs on the other side of the country, kind of thing. And uh, Andrew rang up one day and said, uh, "So I've got a friend. Uh, it's called JJ. Um, he'd like you to uh, quote for a PC." So you know, I came down to our office there and showed Bradford some respects with him, told him what I had for my machine, and. Um, he basically went for you know sort of top of the range. It was like back then it was something like a DX4 100, you know, with a, a diamond a PCI graphics card. With I don't know, it's not a lot of memory on back then. It was more like 256k or 512k or something. You know, I think he went for like eight mega RAM, um, which was a lot at the time. You know, when he got like dual speed CD-ROM drive or quad, it might be quad speed, quad speed Mitsumi or something like that with a sound blaster AWE 42. <coughs> anyway, it's funny there are things to remember, I can't, it's weird how I can remember the exact build of that system. But um, he was really blown away with this system and stuff, and you know, we started exchanging games and I went out to his house once or twice. Um, and as I got to know him a bit better, um, I think it was the second time I went to him or something, he showed me, he had a SNES, um, and he had this really cool device I've never even heard of, and you may or may not have heard of this, it? it was called a um, Super Magic Drive. And it was like this little box that plugged onto the cartridge port on top, like a bit of a parasite that sits on top of the console. Um, and it provides, it's got like a floppy disk drive built in. From memory, I think it was a 1.44 meg drive. And I think the disks formatted to something like 1.6 meg, because it was making use of all the sectors and tracks and things, like 82, 82 or 83 tracks and uh, uh, what is it, something like 10 sectors or something. I can't remember, I can't remember for life of it. But uh, yeah, they were about 1.6 meg, the images. And what you could do is you could stick a cart in it and dump the cart to floppy, you know. And the, the, the firmware built into that thing would say, you know, insert disk one, you put a disk in, and it would 
dump the first part of the roll and set, eject the disc, put disc two in, you do the same. And then once all, that, all that's done, you can take remove the car and you can just use the floppies. You can put, a, you know, put disc one in, boot your console, and it would start to load it into memory and then say, put disc two in, blah, blah. You, know, you, you just do that until it's loaded up. Um, and that was really cool. And I haven't seen one of those um, since that day or before that time. I'd never heard of them and I ain't seen one anywhere. I guess it's the sort of thing that you might not be able to sell easily on eBay because it's perhaps classed as a pirate, some sort of piracy device, you know. Um, which is exactly what it was. There was no other reason for one of those back then. Um, yeah, you could argue people want to back up the carts, but uh, you know, let's look, look, look at it realistically. The carts, they just don't break. Do they? For the most part, they're in, damn near indestructible. So, um, yeah, backing up carts is not, not an early excuse. Uh, in my mind, it was, you know, it was definitely for piracy. Um, but he, yeah, he nicely enough, he lent, loaned me that for um, like a, a weekend or something, and I, you know, I played the arse off it. But because I then suddenly had uh, you know, massive exposure to loads of games that I didn't have, that was kind of what finished it for me for the SNES, because I suddenly played you know, 20 or 30 or 40 games, and I was just like, oh, was that it? You know, a lot of the ones he had were mediocre, as you can imagine, because that Super Magic Drive probably only works with some of the basic mappers. I would expect, and I could be wrong, quote me if I'm wrong, I would expect that that Super Magic Drive probably only handles uh, one or two mappers, really basic ones, you know. So all the best games, which made use of more modern mappers and things, have more, you know, more storage and battery backup and, uh, you know, additional DSP chips and stuff like that, you know, custom hardware. You won't be able to, you wouldn't be able to play those. And, uh, but, uh, just the fact that I've been exposed to a bunch of crap games, I guess, with one or two good tiles, um, I just felt like I'd done it. I'd been there. I'd seen that. You know, I'd seen that. You know, I'd seen everything there was. Really, I felt like I'd got the T-shirt kind of thing. So that was why. I then uh, got rid of my snares. I think I missed that. I'm not down. You fly into those buildings. Um, so uh, that was it. I'm trying to think where I, got, where I got rid of my snares. Oh, that was it. Yeah. Just after he collected that um, Super Magic Drive from me. At the same time, I said, uh, I think I'm going to get rid of my snares. And he was like, oh, okay, well, let me know what you want for it. My mate wants one. So I think I sold it to him for about like hundred pound, which wasn't too bad. It was, you know, I had two or three games out of it for perhaps a year, maybe six months, maybe a year. I don't know, something. It wasn't very long. Considering I only had like four or five games and all the time I had it, you, know, you can imagine. It probably was less than 12 months. God, I'm getting my ass out of here. This is what when you talk and play at the same time. I'm just trying to fly into here, and then I'll probably end this video because uh, I'm pretty much at the end of the story now. There's not much more I want to tell you about my experience with SNES wheel. Um, I mean, I played lots of the games on emulators and stuff. Oh, Alien! That was one I had as well. Alien 3, that was one I knew there was one I'd forgotten about. Um, that's an awesome game as well. I mean, it's again, it's one of those that doesn't um, follow the IP, you know, the actual story of Alien 3s. There's just loads of aliens. It's like, I guess it's. The only way you could have done an Alien 3 game, really, unless you did something like Alien Isolation, you know, with one alien and you never kill it until the end or something. And that would have been a pretty boring game back then. So, um, yeah, Alien 3 is um, it's a bit cross between the, you know, Alien 3 story, theme, prison, scene, etc. combined with aliens, if you like, lots of aliens, multiple. Um, and it's a good game, the sound again just is rock, you know, it's, it's great on that, that, that game, it's superb. Um, sometimes, uh, I, you know, in the past, I found myself just loading that game up in an emulator just to listen to the music because uh, it's really cool. Um, anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.